And this evening we are going to deal with a topic, prayer that works. And you know, I know that all of us have things before the Lord and things that we are praying about. And we want to, we want to get answers to these things. So we want to look at some things, how does prayer work? So I'm going to just share six, six short points this evening. And these points are by no means exhaustive, but I've just chosen six of them that I'm going to share this evening. So the first thing we want to look at is what is prayer. Now, I'm not going to go too much into, into the principles and so on of prayer because we would have already covered that previously. So I'm going to look at some other conditions and so that would make prayer work. So what is prayer? Prayer, the most basic definition of prayer is that prayer is communicating with God. So prayer is, having, is a direct address to God. And as we read the scriptures, we would see that prayer is a very, very dominant theme in scripture. So we want to get our prayer answer. But before we go into, into how we could get our prayer answered, what, what, what are some of the conditions? We want to understand why sometimes, because I know a lot of us, we pray and sometimes we don't get an answer or why sometimes we don't receive an answer. So we want to look at two points why we do not receive an answer. The first one is found in James 4.2. And James 4.2 says, simple, he have not because he asks not. So sometimes we do not get answers because we do not ask. We do not, we do not pray. And that is why we do not get answer. Now, whenever we are looking at a scripture, especially in our private study and so on, it's important that we look at the context. Looking at the context means looking at the scriptures that surround it to get the understanding. So if we look at James 4, 1 to 3, and I'm not going to read the entire thing, you can take a note of it and you could read it after because it's a very interesting passage. James was talking here to Christian people. And there are three things I want to say about it. What James was saying in, in um, verses one, one to three is that, that the people, these believers, they wanted, just like, just like all of us, they wanted a lot of things. And what they were doing is that they were quarreling and fighting among themselves, getting frustrated because they find that they were not getting what it is they wanted. And James said that some of them were even driven to kill. Now, I don't know that the scripture here means that they were actually murdering each other, or if it means that, you know, Jesus said that even if we think hateful thoughts, it come like we murder. So I don't know if that is what they were doing. But the point about it really is that they were doing all of these things in order to try to get what they wanted to get, and yet they refused to pray. That is what James is saying here in verse two. He have not because he asks not. So what they were doing, instead of asking God, they were resorting to ungodly means in order to get what it is that we, what they want. And sometimes this could be us also at times. Sometimes when we think we need something, instead of the first thing that, that we do is that we pray, Sometimes you would start to, our mind would start going into, into first gear real quickly or, or the highest gear, fourth gear, really quickly. And you start to think, all right, how I could do this, boy? How I could do this? And your mind start working over time to figure out a way how to do it. You start talking to people and asking for advice. What do you think is the best option? Nothing is wrong with planning. Nothing is wrong with asking other opinion. Nothing is wrong with others. And sometimes we plunge into action. The problem is, is without consulting God. And then what we expect is that God to bless our efforts when we did not even stop to pray. So James here is addressing that issue and he's saying that if there is something that we need, what we have to do is we have to ask. We have to pray. Because you see, prayers 
on prayed uh, will be prayers on answer. So prayer will not work unless we actually pray. We will never see the results that answered prayer could bring if we don't pray. And I know this seems to be quite an obvious thing that I'm saying here. But if we examine our lives a lot of times, we just rush into action and we just expect things and we don't take time off to pray. Sometimes, you know, you know it is not a case, sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. If we want things to change, we must pray because prayer changes things. We have examples of that in the word of God. And this is very, very, this is a very, very important initial point to note. We must pray. We must ask if we want things to happen in our lives. If we want prayer to, to work, then we must pray. In Mark 7, it gives us the account of the Syrian woman who had a demon-possessed daughter. This is the one who came to Jesus and asked Jesus to cast out the demon. And Jesus said, let the children first be filled, for it is not me to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs, right? You all remember that woman. And when, when, when she's um, eventually, she showed faith by, show, by saying, Lord, but you know, the, the, the um, dogs will eat the scrap that fall out of the master's table. Now, if this woman had not come to God, had not come to Christ, that is equivalent to praying, her daughter would not have been released from that demon possession. What about the blind man outside Jericho? If he did not call out to Christ, he would have remained blind, that is in Luke 18. So God has chosen, the point here is that God has chosen prayer to be the vehicle through which we would obtain answers. And we have not because we do not ask. So if we want answers to pray, we must pray. Let us follow the example of Jesus in Luke 6, 12 to 13. When he was going to choose his 12 disciples, Jesus didn't get up and say, all right, let me see whoever come away, I will choose. He did not do that, you know. What Jesus did, the Bible tells us, is that Jesus spent all night in prayer. He had a major decision to make. He spent, Jesus himself spent all night in prayer. When we have decisions to make, let us not just take it upon ourselves to make the decision, but let us pray about it. What about if we find ourselves in a situation where there might be demonic activity against us, against our families, on our jobs? We know that that is a real thing. Prayer, you know what Jesus said in Matthew 17, 14 to 21, when his disciples could not cast all the demon out of the boy. And they asked Jesus, well, why couldn't we? In verse 21, Jesus says, how be it this kind goeth not out, but by prayer, by prayer and fasting. So if we want deliverance from, 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 from demonic activity, we must pray. What about um, we might be facing temptation, temptation to sin, and we find it is overwhelming and we can't help ourselves. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray that he enter not into temptation. This is one way to overcome temptation by praying. Also, pray for God to meet our needs. Matthew 6, 11 in the, in the Lord's Prayer. The prayer was, give us this day our daily bread. That is our need. So the first point that in order for prayer to work, we must pray. We cannot complain that our prayers are not being answered if we do not pray. We must pray. That is the basic, the first thing. Secondly, I just want to look at some, in, some hindrances that would prevent prayer from working. We could call them prayer blockers. The first one is found in James, in James, we still in James, James, sorry, 4, 3. James 4, 3 says, to, says, we ask and receive not. So look at that. So we are praying. So James here is saying that you're asking. 
right before he was saying that you didn't ask now we can go on to say ask and receive not why there's a reason because he asks a mess that he may consume it upon your own loss so there's a couple a couple words here i want to look at so he's saying here you're asking and prayer not working why because you're praying amiss what is strong strong concordance said amiss means is you're praying with bad intention and the intention james explained what it is that he may consume it upon your lusts now that's another word we want to look at what is the meaning of this loss now a lot of times when we talk about loss we only apply it to sensual or immoral things but really loss is anything that satisfies your fleshly appetite so anything that you're praying for that would allow you as a person to get the glory instead of god to it satisfies your ego it means that you are asking amiss you are not seeking to glorify god you are not looking to we are not seeking to glorify christ but we are seeking to glorify ourselves let me give you some examples let's suppose you are asked to pray whether it's in prayer meeting whether it's at a national level or, or whatever and you're praying to god and you say lord help me when i pray that i will pray a good prayer and your motive behind that really is that you want to impress everybody you want them at the end of it to say oh wow that was a real good prayer boy so the motive is that you would look good rather than the prayer would reach to heaven and to get answers you know what we are praying amiss and we will not get answers to that prayer that prayer will not work another example is let's say you see a brother or your sister being blessed with something and when you see them being blessed with with it you you kind of despise them and say who is she to get that and why i can't get that and you go to god and in prayer and you ask for something that is bigger and something is better and better so that your blessing would trump their blessing what it is what is the motive behind that prayer yeah we are being covetous when we are doing that God will not, that, that prayer will not be answered. We are praying amiss. Or if our hearts and our whole thought and our outlook is weighed down by worldly and, and earthly things, and this is the direction of our prayer, we are praying amiss and God will not answer our prayer. So the point here is that we have to look at the motive the motive if it's the wrong motive that will hinder prayer a second thing that would hinder prayer is unconfessed sin isaiah 59 2 says but your iniquities have separated you and your god and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear so sin separates us from God and God will not hear us. You know, it's interesting when you look at social media and so you see people living all kind of lives, they're cussing everybody, they're doing all kind of wrong things. And then they're praying. And it's, I don't know what God they're praying to, but what, what I do know is that God will, the Bible says that God will not hear that prayer. So if we are living a lifestyle of sin, prayer will not work. David also says in Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So if we are planning tomorrow that when we're going to work, we're going to lie and we are going to say something or we're going to cheat and so on. You know what? We are regarding iniquity on our hearts and God will not answer. Right, so asking God to move on our behalf when we knowingly continue in sin leads to our prayer being unanswered. Another thing is unforgiveness. That is another, another hindrance to effective prayer. Mark eleven twenty five 25 says, and when he stand praying, forgive. If you have an ought against any, that your father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. You see, when we refuse to forgive others, what happened? There's a root of bitterness that grows up in our hearts and it chokes, that, that, that root of bitterness chokes our prayer. And how can we expect God to pour out our blessing, his blessings upon us and answer all our prayer? 
when we ourselves are undeserving if we have a hate and bitterness towards others. And this principle is clearly illustrated in the parable of the un unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, 23 to 35. And that teaches us that God has forgiven us a debt that is beyond measure, that is our sin. And he expects us to forgive others also because to refuse that would hinder our prayer. Another thing is unbelief and doubt that hinders the prayer. James 1, 6 to 7 says, but let him, uh, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let, him not, let not that man think that he will receive anything of the Lord. That is a serious thing there. The Bible here is saying, and James again is saying, that if we are, if we do not, if we are wavering in our faith, if we have doubt and unbelief, that we will not receive anything from the Lord. So doubt and unbelief is a serious hindrance to prayer. And you know, an, an example of this is in Matthew 13. It tells us that Jesus went into his own country. And here what verse 58 says, Matthew 13, 58. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now the Bible tells us that Jesus possessed the power to perform mighty miracles. Jesus had the power over sickness, over nature, over material, uh, material objects, over demons and so on, and even over death itself. Yet, the word says that Jesus did not do many miracles in, in his country, and the reason was because of their unbelief. So where if we doubt, and if we waver, if, you know, today we believe, and then when we get up in the morning, you know, when we start to think about all these circumstances and so on, we say, nah, I don't know, nah, I, I'm not sure if I believe again, I doubt God would do it, and we be wavering back and forth, believing and not believing, having doubt and unbelief and so on. You know what? The Bible says we will, prayer will not work. So what is the remedy for that? How can we solve that? It's an easy thing. The Bible tells us the remedy to doubt and unbelief is faith. And faith comes by hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So in order to expel doubt and unbelief, you must make Read, go to God's word, read God's word, feed yourself on the word of God. When you're going to sleep, play the word of God, play it into your, into your air and let the word of God be the final authority in every matter. And that way we will get rid of the hindrance in our lives because Matthew 21, 22 says, and all things whatsoever he asks in prayer, believe in he shall receive. It is important that we believe. So we have looked at two things so far, is that when looking at prayer that works, is that we must ask, we must pray, and we must also avoid the hindrances to effective prayer, that is the wrong motive, sin, unforgiveness, unbelief, and doubt. Let us now look at conditions to pray to work. We are looking at Matthew 7, 7 to 8. It says, Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and it shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. So here Jesus is saying that when you ask, you will receive. When you, when, you, when you seek, you will find. When you knock, it shall be open unto you. So I have a question. Is this a blanket promise that with no conditions? Like for example, if you get up in the morning and you find, oh God, this place real hot. Yes, I want some snow. I'm going and ask for some snow. Does that mean that God is obligated to just give, give snow, give it to us? Well, that is not what God is saying. That is not what Jesus is saying here. We again, we have to look at it in context. This was during the Sermon on the Mount. 
right? This, Jesus said this during the Sermon on the Mount. And in verse, as we read the other verses, in verse 11, Jesus goes on to give us a condition for asking and receiving. Hear what he says. If ye then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? So one condition to asking and receiving is that we must, what we ask for must be good in God's assessment. You see, God will give beneficial gifts to his children. He will not give, give us things that are bad or things that would cause injury to us, no matter how much we beg and no matter how much we clamor for them. Let me give you an example. If a child, if a child should ask his father for something that the father know is hurtful, like let me say the child is playing in the yard or something, and see, a, and see a, a pretty coral snake on the other side of the fence, and he asks his father, I want that to play with. Would the father give that to him? The child wants it. But you know what? The fa father knows that that is, going to, is, that is not good for him. So the father will not give him. Or if they're doing some work in the, in the, uh, around the place and the child wants to play with a chainsaw, chainsaw and ask the father for that, will he give him? No, the request would be denied because it is not good for him. So no matter how frustrated or unhappy the child might be, what happened, the child has to learn to trust his father, his or her father. Same thing with us. We have to learn to trust God, that God is going to give us the things that are good for us. Let me give you an example. You know, it mightn't be that, you, it mightn't be that you're praying for something that is bad. Eh? You might be praying for a, a, um, a job in a particular company. And God knows that if you get a job in that company, it's going to take you away, take you away from the presence of God, take you away from the, the services. It's going to take you away from, from the influence, godly influence, and place you into, in an ungodly influence and your salvation and so on is going to be at stake. And God might say, no, that is not, I have something else lined up for you. That is not good for you. And because God gives us what is good for us. You know, in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul pray, prayed three times that God would heal him from an affliction. But each time God said no. Why would a loving God refuse to help to heal Paul? Because God had something better for him. And that is a life lived by grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And when Paul understood that, he stopped praying for healing and he began to rejoice in God's strength, being made perfect in his weakness. So if we want our prayer to work, if we want our prayer to be effective, we must understand what is good for us according to God's standards. And that is what we must ask for. Now the natural man, we mind, we in ourselves, we cannot understand what is good, wouldn't necessarily understand what is good for us, you know. But you know what? God has given us the ability. God has given us a, an agent in Romans 8.26. He says, likewise, the Spirit, the spirit of, of God also helpeth our infirmities, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So we go to God and pray and rely on the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, help me to pray in line with what God considers to be good for me. And when we go to God in prayer, admit that God is greater and God knows better. And in every situation that God knows what is best for us. And like the child, trust God that he knows what is best for us. So that is our third point. So the first one, 
We must pray, avoid the hindrances, effective prayer, and ask for what is good in God's assess in God's assessment. Not what we see as good, but what God sees as good. Fourthly, Romans 14, 14 says, if he asks anything in my name, I will do it. So the next condition for prayer that works is asking in the name of Jesus. We must pray in the name of Jesus. So you know, when we hear people praying and, and, and saying in the name of Jesus, that is biblical because Jesus says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And to pray in the name of Jesus means to pray on the basis of Jesus's authority. Now, I don't know how much of you would remember this, but long time, you know, you'll have the shopkeeper and so on. And we didn't have all these big groceries and so on. So in each village, you'll have a, a shop and you'll have the shopkeeper and the shopkeeper will normally have a copy book and and people in the village, he would know all the people in the village would have like a running account with him. With him. So you go, you, you get your groceries and so on. Then when you get pay, you come and, and pay and so on. And this copy book would have each customer's account, so the name of your mom, your dad, whatever, and how much that was owed. And what would happen is sometimes a customer, he may not go himself to make a purchase in the shop. He might send one of his children. The children would go, and say, well, Mr. Ali sent me. And the, the shopkeeper, he knew all the children and so on. So he will know that this child is coming, not in the name of himself, but this child is coming in the name of, of, of Mr. Ali. And he will give him whatever and write it down in the book and so on. So they, so the customer, so the child would receive whatever it is in the name of the account holder. And coming to God in the name of Jesus is similar to these financial transactions because Jesus holds the account. And we are welcome to come to the Father in the name of Jesus to receive all that we need. And the Father willingly grants our request because of Jesus's standing with him. Now, of course, if we are asking something that is contrary to the character of Jesus, then we cannot expect to get something like that. But you see, a lot of times, too often, we pray, and sometimes we pray weak prayers because our eyes are upon the impossible situation, when in reality, God has invited us to pray in the powerful name of Jesus, because the God of the universe, the victorious Savior, he is standing there on our behalf in strength and his and power, and his name is a strong, a strong tower and a, and a fortress that the forces of darkness cannot withstand. He can do anything. So let us, if we want our prayer to work, let us pray in the name of Jesus upon the authority of the name of Jesus, that is in the name of Jesus, because in the name of Jesus, every sickness has to go, every need would be met, every, every demon has to flee in the name of Jesus. So this is not a magic formula, you know, that, that you know, just say in the name of Jesus, we have to understand it and we have to be in Christ. We have to be found in Christ so that we have the authority to use the name of Jesus. So that is the fourth thing that we, that we are learning, pray in the name of Jesus. And fifthly, and I'm going along quickly because I have two more to share, is that we, pray according to his will. First John 5, 14 says, and we have this confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Prayer will work when we pray for the things that are in agreement with 
God's word. And a good example or the supreme example I should say of this is when Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. He said, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But in Luke 22, 42, he says, not my will, but thy will be done. That is the principle he was teaching. The principle he was teaching us is when we pray, we must align our desire to God's will. Now, how can we know what is God's will? One of the ways that we can know God's will is, of course, the Holy Spirit. Another one that, as I mentioned before, asks God for the wisdom. James 1.5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abrade it not, and it shall be given to him. And this works when we ask God for wisdom, it works. Let me quickly give you an example. Before the pandemic, I had a decision to make, and I would have asked a couple of people, including Pastor V, to pray concerning it, um, whether I should do a particular thing or not. And you know, I felt as God was saying that, no, don't, don't do that as yet. Don't do that right now, or don't do it. And it turned out the pandemic came, and, the pan and when the pandemic came, I understood what was the will of God when the pandemic came, and I thank God for giving me that wisdom not to do what I was really, really planning to do. So when we ask God for the wisdom concerning his will, God gives us the wisdom. This is quite similar to the point before by that God gives us what is good for us. Because you see, God knows the future. God could see the, God could see everything that is going to happen. And he knows. And you, we could pray and ask God for the wisdom of what his will in every situation is. And he will answer. Another place to go is in the word of God. John 7, 15, 7 says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. God's will is revealed through the scripture. And the more we understand God's word, the more we read God's word, the more we internalize God's word, the more we will understand what God wants, what is God's will concerning us. So when we go to prayer, essentially what we should be saying, Lord, this is what, this is my desire, you know, but Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, show me what is your will in this matter. Because you, you see, prayer is not a means of getting God to do our will, you know, but it is a means of getting God's will to be done on earth and God's will to be done in our lives. So, you know, if we are praying for something, I, I have had the experience praying for something and asking God and, it, and God through circumstances and so on saying, no, this is not my will for you. And sometimes we still pursue after it and run behind it and make it happen. And then we are ever so sorry that we did not stay in God's will. So in order to get prayer that works, the fifth point there is pray according to God's will. And the final point is found in, in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. When we engage in prayer concerning any matter, we are not to give up. Jesus related a parable to us with this, this same truth in mind in, in Luke 18, 1 to 5. And he started it by saying, men ought always to pray and not to faint. And he talked about a widow who, wanted, who went and complained to a judge. And, and she keep going. She was persistent. She keep going at the judge. And the judge said, look, I really want to do this, you know, but because this woman is so persistent that I am going to, she, I am going to give her her request. Well, God is not like that judge, of, of course, but it really is showing the principle of persistence. You see, prayer brings us into this 
into the spiritual, the supernatural realm. And when we pray, God, the enemy don't want God's will to be accomplished in our lives. You know, he don't want God's good to come into our lives. So he's going to try to block it. But, you know, Daniel tells us about that. Let us continue praying. Let us be persistent. Let us pray without ceasing. So this is, this is effective prayer. Don't stop praying. You know, Matthew 7, 7, we already look at it, where it says, ask, seek, knock. This sounds like, like just easy, um, very easy actions. But what Jesus did, the idea behind this is he was saying, be, keep persistent, keep asking, continue seeking, don't quit knocking. This is not just a, a cookbook recipe, you just follow it and the recipe will come out. But our attitude is I'm going to be persistent there in prayer until God answers. Now, God might say no, it's not his will. God might say yes, and I might get it. Or sometimes God would say wait. And this is where the problem is. Let us be persistent and hold on in prayer when God says to wait. This is the prayer that would work. So in conclusion, we have looked at six points here. Prayer that works, we must pray. We must ask. We must. Then the second thing is that we must avoid the variance, the various hindrances. We must also look for what is good in God's assessment, pray in the name of Jesus and be persistent in our prayer. And I feel I would have left out one. And, you know, prayer is an important part of a Christian's life. And our prayer life, we must develop our prayer life because prayer really is plugging into God's power. It is our means of, of defeating the enemy in our life because we are powerless to, to defeat the enemy on our own, you know. So, you know, this evening I want to encourage us that may the throne of God find us, find us often before it, tarrying in prayer, crying out unto God because God promised us promises that the, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avail at much. So today I want to encourage us, let us not worry about anything. Philippians 4, 6 to 7 says that, don't worry. So instead of worrying, let us pray. Let us commit it into the hands of the Lord. Let us get rid of whatever hindrances that would prevent prayer. Let us get rid of that. Let us pray in the name of Jesus. Let us pray for what is good. Let us pray according to his will and let us be persistent in prayer and let us just hold on to God in the name of Jesus. At this time, may God bless you as I hand back over to Sister Donna.